All right, good morning. It's a pretty good turnout. Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, my, my eyes are a little red and blurry this morning, um, not because I've been up all night drinking fine wine in Sonoma, uh, but because I woke up with a slight eye irritation. So I got to have my slides here, my notes here, so I could see them. And if at any point I'm no longer facing the audience during my talk, if you could be so kind as just to give me like a polite shout out and uh, let me know where you're at. Um, just kidding, it's, it's not that bad. Uh, anyway, I'm Austin Collins. I guess I'm an instigator of this serverless movement. Uh, I, uh, in 2015, I created a very popular open source project called the Serverless Framework. Uh, and this, this is an application framework that allows you to build apps exclusively on serverless infrastructure like AWS Lambda. Um, and I think that this framework in particular had a lot to do in showing the world kind of how powerful this technology and this trend can be. Uh, I'm also the founder and CEO of a startup called Serverless Inc. Uh, we're based in San Francisco. We make tools and services to help uh, developers and teams uh, build and operate serverless applications, regardless of platform. And uh, our company is also helping out with the standardization efforts happening within the CNCF around serverless concepts, uh, which I'll dig into later in this talk. Anyway, this is serverless state of the union, special open source edition, special exclusive. Uh, in this talk, we're going to uh, analyze what's happening uh, in the serverless world. We're going to try and forecast you know, what's going to happen next. Uh, and we're going to discuss leveraging open source to smartly adopt serverless today. So let's get started. Boom. Uh, amidst containers, orchestrators, VMs, PaaS, uh, out of left field, out of nowhere, basically, came this, this serverless trend. I don't think anyone was really expecting it. And it picked up momentum rapidly. Uh, it has won hearts and minds of developers, and it's not slowing down. Uh, we, we clearly have a trend here on our hands. And now, what's the big deal? Why, why, is, why is this trend catching on? Um, why is this important? Uh, so first off, to clarify, if you aren't already aware, uh, serverless means that those servers exist. Uh, developers don't have to think about them. Uh, it's not a very technically accurate term. It's about as technically accurate as the term the cloud, I'd say. Uh, but once you, say, once you say that word to a developer and you see that enthusiasm that it invokes, that emotional response, uh, it, you know, there's, there's, no, um, there's no reason why. It, it's easy to recognize why this buzzword caught on, why it is the buzzword, because uh, it invokes all the right emotions. Um, and it's all about you know, using tools, using infrastructure that get out of your way so that you could focus on solving business problems. Um, and this simple idea you know, has been around for a long time and obviously has, has mass appeal. <clears throat> um, and this simple idea, you know, a, a reason why, we, we get, uh, why this has become such a big trend is that because, first off, this does a, a great job of solving ancient problems. Um, in our serverless framework, uh, we ha have significant enterprise adoption. And when these users uh, come to us, we always ask them, you know, why are you here? What's so interesting about this uh, to you? And they always tell us the same, you know, that they're looking to solve the same problems. That is, number one, they want to move fast. They want to reduce time to market. Number two, they want to increase innovation. They're saying, heck, our competitors are moving very fast. Our competitors are doing all these cool things. We want to do the same. And uh, they also want to reduce operational overhead, of course, and reduce cost. And despite how far we've come with how, uh, so much great uh, change and innovation in IT, uh, we still have not solved these ancient problems yet. And the serverless movement is kind of a testament to that. And it's why serverless has, has picked up so much momentum. Um, at the same time, serverless solves new problems, uh, problems that are just starting to come into fruition. And I don't know how to characterize these um, more concisely than to say uh, you know, the, the digital world is storming into reality right now. Uh, we've got Internet of Things devices uh, everywhere uh, with sensors collecting all types of data, generating big data. Uh, we've got machine learning, artificial intelligence uh, infused into all this, um, building systems of intelligence, systems that can make decisions in real time, uh, creating autonomous machines, self-driving cars. Uh, we've got computing running in the edge all over the place, voice devices. Um, technology is, is everywhere. And uh, if you're a business, you have to pay attention to all this uh, because your competitors are. And amidst these ancient problems and all these new problems, you know, one, of course, has to ask themselves uh, a very important question. And that is, do you really want to be running your own infrastructure? Uh, is that kind of a good position for you <laughs> right now? Is that kind of the, going to be on the right side of, of history, that choice? Um, and that's, you know, I, I think you could see where the people in the serverless movement stand. Um, but they're, you know, they're very nervous about burdening themselves with this 
especially in this era of upcoming hyper-innovation and hyper-competition. So serverless, a brief history. I'm not going to go into PaaS. I'm just going to start with the serverless trend uh, starting back in 2014. Um, this kind of got kicked off with Amazon Web Services when they came out with a new way to do compute in the cloud called AWS Lambda. Uh, and in the early days, you know, they were kind of marketing this as glue code, as um, event-driven code, and it was very limited. The use cases were very limited. <clears throat> uh, but at the core, there was a revolutionary way to do compute. And it was revolutionary because all you had to do as a developer was upload some code. And you'd write this code in the form of a function, enough code to perform one task, like save a user uh, to a database or send out a transactional email. You'd upload that code to AWS Lambda's platform, and that would create an AWS Lambda function, this independent unit of deployment. Uh, and this function would require very little to zero administration. The provider handles everything. Um, and it scales automatically to meet massive levels of concurrency. Uh, and also, AWS Lambda had this pay-per-execution, pay-per-use pricing model that was incredibly efficient. And this cannot be understated. When people come uh, join the serverless movement, it's this pricing model that really brings them through the door. Uh, and then they kind of stay for, once they look at all these qualities together, they realize that there is a lowest total cost of ownership scenario here that is absolutely compelling. Uh, but this pricing model is super important. You're not going to get charged unless your code runs. And when you do get charged, you get charged at 100 millisecond increments. <clears throat> Very exciting. And lastly, this code is event-driven. Um, these functions will spin up to handle any type of events, uh, a lot of events mostly coming from the underlying platform. Uh, so when something happens in your AWS S3 bucket, it'll automatically trigger a function. Or when a record gets saved to a DynamoDB table, it'll trigger a function or an HTTP re web request. Um, in the serverless world, even these HTTP requests are being considered as, as events. <clears throat> uh, so back in, back in uh, 2015, you know, AWS Lambda, the use cases were very limited. The, you know, it was, I don't think it had great packaging. I don't think it had a great uh, developer experience. And it certainly was not being considered as an application platform. Um, and this is where kind of our company uh, stepped in. You know, we came out to try and define the application experience around AWS Lambda because at the core, we saw that revolutionary compute service and we basically wanted to use it for everything, right? Um, and we needed some tooling to enable that. Uh, so we started working on this serverless framework uh, mid-2015 um, and it solves a lot of problems that need to be solved if you want to build serverless architectures. Uh, most importantly, when you build a serverless architecture, it's pretty uh, complicated. First off, you have all these independent units of deployment, all these functions, uh, and there are a lot of these. Um, this is very much like a traditional kind of microservice architecture. However, the difference in the serverless world is that uh, the, the overhead burden is not there uh, with these serverless functions because the provider is managing scale, managing you know, all aspects of administration. And what happens and what we see regularly is that people who are doing serverless development um, could be one or two engineers, and they, they're provisioning hundreds of these functions. Um, it's pretty awesome. It's all because that overhead burden is not there. Uh, so you have a whole bunch of functions, a whole bunch of independent units of deployment, and all these functions have in infrastructure dependencies. Uh, they need infrastructure to trigger the functions via events, and they also need infrastructure to perform their business logic, whether it's a database, caching mechanism, or storage. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so we looked at all this in the early days, and we said, you know, this... There's, there's, a, there's an application story here that's, that's pretty compelling. And how can we express this in a, in a simpler format so that people don't have to think about things um, in this very complicated way? So the one thing that I think the serverless framework did very well is they said, look, um, this is, serverless is simply a story of functions and events. And that's what we presented to developers. We gave them a simple configuration file. You could list all your functions um, containing your business logic. And every single function in that configuration file could have an events property. And that you could list there all the events that would trigger that function, all the events that happen in your digital business. Um, and this, this whole experience uh, was very, very compelling to users. All they'd have to do is type serverless deploy. And the serverless framework will go provision all the infrastructure necessary and wire it up so that it works together in this event-driven model. Um, and the user and the developers wouldn't have to think about that as much. So again, I think this open source project had a lot to do in kind of showing the world the serverless architecture, introducing the serverless application to the world. Um, and up next in 2016, given the massive success of AWS Lambda, uh, a lot of the other public cloud providers took note, and they started to offer uh, very similar services. Um, Google came out with uh, Google Cloud Functions. Azure came out with Azure Functions. IBM came out with IBM Cloud Functions. 
Uh, and overall, uh, these serverless functions, also known as uh, functions as a service, <clears throat> they're a great way to use these cloud platforms. Uh, they're a great way to adopt cloud platforms. If you want to use a cloud platform and gain access to all the cool services that that cloud platform uh, offers, stick a function there. It's auto-scaling, you know, it's pay for execution. Uh, it's a very, very trivial way to start leveraging, leveraging that cloud platform. And this is, this is exciting because I think that this is going to enable more vendor, uh, vendor choice um, and multi-provider capability in the future. In 2016, uh, we also saw more open source heroes enter the scene. Uh, and they started coming out with uh, open source versions of serverless compute platforms, essentially. Uh, and these projects seek to give organizations uh, the ability to make their own serverless computing platforms, you know, largely based on uh, containers uh, in Kubernetes. We've got great projects in this space, like Kubeless, uh, Oracle's FN project. Um, there's OpenFAS and IBM's OpenWhisk, and a lot more. These things are popping up a lot right now. There'll probably be two more by tomorrow. Um, now, in this scenario, you're still managing your own infrastructure, right? You kind of bring one of these into your organization. You have a few people operating the serverless platform, and it's their job to expose it to developers so developers can focus on solving business problems with the least amount of friction. Um, so is it serverless? Uh, I don't know. Um, but, but what it does borrow heavily from the cloud experience is that application experience is emulated in these platforms. Uh, that simple story of functions and events. Um, these things can be perceived as PaaS 2.0, and one of the biggest changes uh, is simply this model of doing things. It's a simple story of functions and events. And now you could kind of self-host this anywhere you want. Uh, and, that's, and that's pretty exciting. Uh, in 2017, um, we started to see <coughs> Uh, the, you know, the serverless term continued to grow, and all of a sudden, a lot of cloud infrastructure beyond computing uh, was being called serverless. Uh, Amazon kind of took the lead on this. They started referring to kind of their, their traditional SaaS products as serverless. So AWS S3, which has been around for a very long time, uh, they started to call that serverless. SNS, they're starting to call that serverless. A lot of their new services, like uh, uh, their Aurora database, um, is now being referred to as serverless. And a lot of these independent uh, SaaS providers are kind of using the term serverless to refer to their, um, to their products, like Algolia. I've seen them do this Auth0. Um, and that's pretty interesting. I think it has some implications for the serverless application in general. Uh, and the serverless application now is kind of being perceived as using serverless compute and pairing it with infrastructure that has these serverless qualities, auto-scaling, you know, paper use. And combining these things together to make end results are applications that have extremely low total cost of ownership. Uh, they're pay per execution, they're auto scaling, they're almost like set it and forget it. And these applications are very efficient and, and very powerful. So that's what has happened. Uh, here's here's kind of what's happening now and, um, and some things to pay attention to. Uh, there's, there's clearly a collision happening between serverless computing functions as a service uh, and containers. I think it's getting a bit awkward, actually. Um, traditionally, containers offered great isolation, you know, packaging, portability, but not low latency provisioning or an efficient pricing model for running them in the cloud. Uh, meanwhile, AWS Lambda offered low latency provisioning, runtimes ready to go, sub-second billing, um, and this simple kind of functional model. Uh, in the serverless world, people have been using both these things uh, for different use cases. Containers are, have been great for asynchronous, uh, long-running tasks. And functions are great for short tasks uh, where you don't have to think, where you don't want to have to kind of think about containers, only the business logic and, um, how you, and if you want to benefit from that efficient pricing model. But now containers as a service are looking more like serverless container platforms. Azure Container Service has a per second billing model, you know, no virtual machine management. AWS has Fargate, you know, it's a managed container platform also with the per second billing model. Uh, both of these are gonna continue uh, to probably collide uh, and exist and evolve. And this is still the beginning of this story, but it's certainly something to watch. Uh, furthermore, <clears throat> software as a service is, continues to expand. Um, and this is important because SaaS's value on top of serverless computing cannot be understated. In the early days of the serverless framework, uh, we noticed amazing innovation and creativity coming from the users. And first off, it's because you know, when you reduce operational overhead, uh, you liberate a lot of productivity and you also liberate creativity. Um, but a lot of this also came from simply pairing kind of serverless compute from pairing AWS Lambda uh, with other kind of SaaS, other serverless uh, infrastructure. 
Um, and we kind of realized that you know, Lambda is only half the value. You've got to have other great serverless-like infrastructure to pair it with to build these, these end results, these applications. Um, it's a very exciting time because you know, a lot more SaaS is coming. Uh, the cloud providers are aggressively innovating new products uh, with SaaS models, uh, and so are startups. Um, so, you know, Amazon, of course, has S3, DynamoDB, Lambda, uh, they have their new Aurora, they've got Comprehend, their natural language processing service, they've got Transcribe for speech recognition. Meanwhile, Google has a ton of cool cloud AI products like uh, Cloud Speech, Translation, their Vision API, Video Intelligence APIs. Uh, that whole cloud AI category, I think, is just going to explode, um, will continue to explode. And, you know, overall, this is, this is exciting. Um, this is like the golden age of software development. I mean, never has there been this like greater time to be able to use all these kind of uh, these pieces of infrastructure to make things faster, to make things at scale, um, to get your vision out there and make some type of uh, meaning in the world. Um, so overall, this is you know a lot of stuff is going on, but uh, it's all pretty exciting. Another big trend to look out for is serverless functions are kind of running everywhere now. Um, they can clearly run in multiple cloud providers. Uh, now that every cloud provider has a serverless uh, experience, um, they're running on-premise uh, thanks to these uh, open source serverless platforms. Uh, and they could also run in the edge. You know, Cloudflare's got a great Cloudflare worker project. Uh, Lambda has Lambda at edge. And we're quickly entering this world where these, these functions can live uh, all over the place. Um, and that's great because events, data is, is all over the place. <clears throat> Um, so what, with all this stuff going on, there's a lot of change, a lot of innovation, a ton of options now and projects. Uh, how do we adopt this today? And here's kind of the most important lessons that, that we've learned over at Serverless Inc. Uh, first off, you know, we, we talk to you know, these uh, enterprise organizations regularly, and uh, they're in a tough bind. Um, a lot of them are kind of caught in this, this adoption challenge. You know, they want to avoid lock-in. They also want total control and oversight. Uh, but at the same time, um, they want to move fast. They want to innovate. <clears throat> and uh, many are choosing to kind of uh, DIY their own serverless platforms. So I've, you know, we've seen several companies working on their own serverless platforms for a number of years now um, to avoid vendor lock-in and give them the control and oversight they need. Uh, on the other hand, we've seen uh, the cloud providers unrelentingly add innovative services, serverless offerings, um, to their whole platform, and we've seen a lot of companies embracing those and being very successful at delivering innovation at record pace. Um, so how does one, how does an organization kind of navigate this? <clears throat> uh, and this is where open source especially uh, can save the day. Um, so, so what we've learned, of course, and a big serverless principle is that, uh, first off, it's all relative uh, to the use case. Einstein actually said this, the second half just got cut off. Um, <laughs> But uh, you know, this is you know, something that's very popular in the serverless community, uh, and it's just central to the serverless culture. And that is focus on the use case, focus on the outcome first, uh, not infrastructure and platforms. Uh, figure out what is most important to best serve that use case. You know, do you need to move fast? Do you need, need to be, be innovative? Do you need to capture the market? Or do you want to kind of avoid lock-in uh, and maybe some public clouds in general? Uh, and if you do that, if you run your own platform, kind of at, what is the opportunity cost of doing that? And the great thing about serverless is that lower overhead appeals to all types of use cases. Um, it's often used for kind of critical data processing pipelines, back-end services, but also equally used for marketing projects, internal tools, random event-driven automation, business process automation. You know, do you really need to roll out your own platform to do kind of all this stuff? You know, maybe not. Um, if the one platform approach is going to block you from being able to solve a problem best, you know, that's, that's not super, that's not good. Uh, so you could do a serverless a lot of different ways now, and the best way will be revealed always by focusing on the outcome. Uh, so focus on that first. And you know, what I strongly recommend is that before adopting any serverless platform, and again, there's so many great options out there, whether it's AWS or one of these cool open source serverless platforms, I would absolutely prioritize investing uh, in tools that offer vendor and platform choice um, and organize your strategy all around that. Uh, there are a handful of great tools that do this, you know, like our serverless framework or Terraform is another fantastic one. Uh, but these things are going to give you options, and that's of critical importance right now. And they're also going to give you a single experience for using, for using these options. Uh, and again, this is where open source especially has to play a big role. Um, you know, open source communities have to come up with more tools like this because you know, these big platforms have big biases you know, towards their platforms. Uh, and if that future is running serverless functions everywhere, uh, we need the tooling to help make that easy. 
So again, first focus on your outcome uh, and then adopt the tools that will flexibly allow you to deliver on those outcomes best. Uh, the future is uncertain, change is constant, you know, tools that give you options, a diversified approach should absolutely be prioritized. Uh, and further, you know, serverless is all about moving up the stack uh, to the application level. And we think serverless is gonna evolve these developer tools and infrastructure in general and, and infrastructure provisioning tools uh, to focus more on the application level. And this is something that, uh, this is a theme that we think about a lot at Serverless Inc. Uh, we're always trying to figure out how to, how to express this team. You know, we think software tooling should be designed more around outcomes and apps uh, and not infrastructure. And this is also what Serverless is strongly about. We kind of started this uh, with the Serverless framework. Um, and we also have a new project which we're opening up uh, in a beta uh, in a few weeks. Um, it's called Serverless Components. Uh, it's simply open source, reusable, vendor agnostic, serverless building blocks. It's a packaging system for application features uh, or entire applications, you know, built using serverless infrastructure across all vendors. Uh, you can compose these building blocks together uh, to rapidly build apps. And these components are very outcome focused, uh, whether it's, you know, your data processing pipeline, a user's credit API, an SMS subscription service, um, subscription payment service or an entire serverless forum or an entire serverless e-commerce application. You should be able to compose this stuff together uh, to build end results with that serverless efficiency. Uh, we're opening this up as a standalone public beta. Uh, we're gonna incorporate it into our framework. If it's interesting to you, you could go to serverless.com and you know, sign up for the newsletter. Uh, but again, focus on your outcomes uh, and then adopt the flexible tools that will allow you to best deliver on those outcomes. Uh, and after that, <clears throat> lean on community-driven standards. Uh, these, the standards, uh, the harmonization conversations are just getting started in the serverless space, uh, and it's exciting because it could solve a lot of problems. Uh, for example, making functions more portable uh, so that they can move around um, to wherever they need to go, or event data more consistent. Uh, the CNCF is kind of where these conversations are taking place. <clears throat> uh, there's a serverless working group uh, within the CNCF, and we're meeting every Thursday, uh, 9 a.m. Pacific time, to talk about this stuff. Uh, the serverless working group recently authored a great white paper talking about serverless in general, uh, and now they're focused on harmonizing these serverless concepts uh, to give users vendor choice and flexibility. Uh, first effort uh, of the serverless working group, or the next effort, is uh, you know, that we found that an uncontroversial starting point when it comes to harmonization uh, was around events, and we've, we're working on this, uh, this concept called cloud events. It's a specification for um, for describing event data in a common way. Uh, again, serverless is a story of function and events. Uh, this is half that story. Um, and event data is being transported across environments uh, increasingly. And unfortunately, all the platforms that are publishing events, they're kind of ubiquitous, events are everywhere, but they're all publishing them in different formats, which limits um, the ability to transform event data uh, wherever you want it to go. <clears throat> Um, so we think this, this might actually have a huge rising tide effect. It could be bigger than serverless. Events are kind of bigger than serverless at the end of the day. Uh, it might affect all of IT. Uh, but we're kicking this off in the serverless working group um, because it's part of the service story. It's an essential part. Uh, there are a ton of major industry stakeholders involved now, and it's super exciting. So uh, if, you're, if you're curious about this, I uh, strongly recommend you jump in. Uh, to wrap up, you know, whether you're adopting serverless or you're looking for a role, open source has to play in the serverless space. Uh, you know, first off, focus on outcomes, not infrastructure. That is an important serverless principle. Uh, adopt tools to flexibly support those outcomes, not tools that kind of support a specific platform. And embrace standards when they mature uh, or help us build them right now. If any of this sounds interesting uh, to you, uh, here's my contact info. You can learn more about the serverless framework at serverless.com. And if cloud events is of interest to you or the serverless working group in general, uh, go to github.com slash cloud events. There's a ton of information as to how you could join the effort and start contributing. Uh, anyway, thank you all uh, for your time. And uh, next up, we've got Dan Kahn, the executive director of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, uh, who's going to show you something special that they've been working on. Anyway, thanks again. Hi there. 
I'm Dan Kahn. I'm the executive director of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. I want to really thank Austin for uh, that great talk and talking about serverless, which is really one of the most exciting spaces in open source right now. Uh, I also want to thank him for donating three minutes at the end of his talk so I could just show you uh, a cool project that we've been working on at CNCF. And I also do want to thank him for his leadership with uh, both the serverless working group, but then particularly cloud events. So a uh, quick show of hands, how many people have seen some version of this document before? Uh, okay, more than half. So uh, this is the cloud native landscape. Uh, many people have said that it's uh, incredibly useful and valuable. Uh, it has also been referred to as the hellscape. And uh, so we've gotten a little criticism for the tyranny of choice, for seeming like it's uh, too complicated. And so uh, we went back and looked at how we could make this more useful for real enterprises and vendors and, and the end users that are, and the developers that are, uh, make up our cloud native community. And we decided to do two different follow on projects. So the first uh, that we're launching is called the cloud native trail map. And uh, this is a one page, it's actually a portrait, but it takes you through the steps of how uh, you might approach cloud native. And so containerization and this real focus on continuous integration, continuous delivery, which is arguably the area that's gonna have the very highest value, the biggest return, then talks about orchestration. And then as we go forward, you look at some of the other projects. So service meshes are incredibly hot right now and you have Envoy and Linkerd and Core DNS, but that's not where you wanna get started in this space. And we'll actually have handouts for you uh, of this at the, uh, at the next break and it's also available online. So that was uh, the sort of the zoom out version of how can you just approach cloud native and begin thinking about it and begin learning about it. But then for the practitioners and the folks that are really uh, eyebrow deep in it, we also wanted to have the zoom in version. And so that is the new interactive landscape that we're launching here at the conference. And uh, you can actually pull out your phone or your laptop and try typing this in right now. It's l.cncf.io or landscape.cncf.io. And it will show you the 460 different projects and products that we're monitoring and following in this space. And so I will go ahead and um, I'm no Kelsey Hightower, but just try and do a, uh, a quick demo for you. So you can see that we show uh, Kubernetes, which um, Jan Goldberg announced that we graduated uh, yesterday, our incubating CNCF projects, our sandbox projects, and then um, a lot of other logos. This has been a, a project um, for the last couple months, and uh, Jim and I and a few other uh, Linux Foundation folks were traveling through China three weeks ago uh, Beijing and Hangzhou, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Hong Kong in five days. And uh, I got the feedback of, why do you keep staring at all these logos? But uh, as I was dealing with uh, data caps, this was the, the project that we've been working on. But the part that's particularly neat about it is the ability to actually zoom in and kind of think about it in different ways. So for example, here's open source projects by first commit. And so we're pulling this data from GitHub. And if I click in, I can see that Postgres was actually found, uh, started 22 years ago, but uh, their latest commit was today, which is just such an extraordinary accomplishment of an open source project. MariaDB, being a fork of MySQL, are both 18 years old, and I can click through and see a lot of other ones. And for each of these, I can then pull up the, uh, the Twitter info to see what's been going on most recently, the funding info that we're pulling from Crunchbase, so you can see uh, they've raised $10.5 million. And another view, if I come here to uh, open source projects by stars, I can see uh, here's Kubernetes at number one with uh, 33,000 stars. But look at that, uh, Austin's uh, project, serverless, is here as the fifth entry. And uh, we're very happy to have them as a CNCF member. And I'll point out they're $3 million in funding according to Crunchbase. So any of the venture capitalists in the audience might want to uh, go up and talk to him. Uh, so uh, I do encourage you to take a look, and um, if you pop it up later today, it's uh, fun to click those example filters to uh, look at your organization and see the projects that uh, come up. And then uh, in any project this size, there's gonna be errors in it. So we're really eager to accept pull requests. It's uh, something you can do right from the GitHub web interface and we can approve it and get it live almost immediately. So this is really designed to be a collaborative editing project. 
Uh, and so we do have an updated version of the landscape with even more logos on it. We now list our Kubernetes certified service providers, all of the uh, 50 certified Kubernetes platforms and distributions and everything else. And we'll keep coming out with a new version of this every month that's going to map to the interactive landscape. This is also uh, the serverless version of it that was a project uh, that Austin and everyone else from the serverless work group worked on. So um, please um, feel free to tweet about this. Uh, if you have issues or questions or suggestions, please reach out to me at my email. And thanks again to Austin for uh, giving me those five minutes.